Hello everybody, my name is Rivecha, and welcome to the Pokemon Conspiracy Iceberg. At this point, you know the drill. An iceberg video consists of numerous topics organized into layers, becoming more obscure as the layers go down. This iceberg in particular is by Reddit user Angel12416, and it stood out to me when I was looking at new icebergs to cover. First of all, it's a Pokemon iceberg, and I love Pokemon. However, there are no shortage of Pokemon icebergs out there, so I typically wouldn't be doing this, but this iceberg stood out to me. It mostly revolves around Pokemon conspiracies and theories, not just the Pokemon franchise as a whole. As such, there are some unique entries on here that I haven't seen in many of the other Pokemon iceberg videos, and explaining the entries also involves a little bit of creative writing rather than just reciting something off a wiki page, which makes it more interesting for me. I'll also provide some counter-arguments for most theories, and whether or not I think the theory is true or not. This iceberg covers topics from a wide variety of Pokemon media, including the games, anime, manga, mystery dungeon, and more. So that's a bonus, it's not just the main franchise in the anime. So with that being said, let's get right into the Pokemon Conspiracy Iceberg. Layer 1. Pokemon War. The Pokemon War refers to an implied war that took place sometime shortly before the events of Pokemon Generation 1, which took place in 1996. The main bit of dialogue supporting this is from Lieutenant Surge, the Electric-type gym leader of the Kanto region. He says you won't live long in combat, not with your puny power. I tell you, kid, Electric Pokemon saved me during the war. They zapped my enemies into paralysis. Another piece of evidence thrown around to suggest the war is the lack of many adult males in the early Pokemon games. Most notably, in almost all the games, your father is missing, and there aren't a lot of middle-aged men around. The only males are children or very old men. And other than that, they're either professors, powerful gym leaders, or elite four, or criminals and essential workers. The idea here is that most of the other adult men were drafted into the war and died. The Pokemon War has been one of the most popular conspiracies regarding the franchise since its inception, and people have spent a lot of time trying to find out more about the war, including what other regions were involved and when exactly it took place. However, I do think the theory as a whole is not true. Let me explain. The largest bit of evidence pointing towards the war is Lieutenant Surge's dialogue in the original games, which, in all fairness, is considered canon. However, to think that this was an attempt by Game Freak to world build and give lore to Pokemon is not necessarily correct. For Pokemon Red and Blue, Game Freak were not trying to create like a complete fictional story or world. They just had a cool idea for a creature collecting game, and they had to throw together a story and characters for the game to work. For example, the Kanto games have a lot of references to real-world locations that were later just ignored or retconned. Lieutenant Surge is known as the Lightning American in Red and Blue, a sign that was later removed because, well, America doesn't exist in the Pokemon world. And Lieutenant Surge is now implied to be from the Unova region, Pokemon's equivalent to America. Raichu's original Pokedex entry mentioned an Indian elephant, whereas a later, very similarly worded Dex entry replaced the Indian elephant with Kaparaja, an elephant Pokemon. In Generation 1, Game Freak didn't intend to create a Pokemon world. It was The games were just set in our world, or a world very similar to ours, except with the strange creatures and monsters. If we take this into account, the war the Tenant Surge talks about is most likely the Gulf War, which happened in the early 1990s. However, as Game Freak added more regions, they made the Pokemon world be its own thing separate from our world, and the references to the real world ended. In Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, Lieutenant Surge is not called American, nor does he have any dialogue about war. Also, I never found the theory of the lack of adult men to make sense. There are tons of young adult men in the original games, hikers, bird keepers, bikers, swimmers, and many more. There are arguably less adult women in the original games than adult men. And in all fairness, Game Freak is not known for fleshing out their worlds a lot. There's not a lot of NPCs because, you know, they didn't want to code in a bunch of NPCs. So yeah, while the Great Pokemon War is a cool idea, I think that it's not a true theory. Ho-Oh made Ash immortal. Now we have a popular theory about the anime. In episode 1 of the Pokemon anime, Ash sees the legendary Ho-Oh at the end of the episode, flying over a rainbow. In the games, a lot of Ho-Oh's dex entries state that anybody who sees it is promised eternal happiness. So what would make Ash happy forever? Well, staying young forever so he could keep going on adventures with his Pokemon across the world. So this theory states that Ho-Oh fulfilled Ash's happiness by making him immortal so that he could be a young trainer forever. It is a fun theory, but I do struggle to buy this. Marvelous Bridge Girl In Pokemon Black and White, there is a girl who stands on the Marvelous Bridge who disappears when you approach her. 
A nearby NPC expresses shock at her disappearing. An old woman who stands at the entrance of the bridge tells you about a young girl who used to play with an Abra in this area before the bridge was built. We get more context in Pokemon Black and White 2 with the Strange House. The girl appears again in this house talking about dark dreams and a lunar wing. We find the lunar wing in the house and the girl tells us to give it to Cresselia, whom we can encounter on the Marvelous Bridge. So what does all this mean? Well, we know that she has something to do with Cresselia and Darkrai, the Pokemon of good dreams and nightmares respectively. In the Generation 4 games, we encounter a boy who is tormented by nightmares to the point of incapacitation. These nightmares were caused by Darkrai. We saved this boy from Darkrai by giving him the Lunar Wing. The same situation probably happened long ago with this girl. Her family researched her situation, as shown by the books about Darkrai and Cresselia in the Strange House, and learned that the powers of the Lunar Wing could cure her. But by the time they were able to get a Lunar Wing to the girl, she had already passed away from the nightmares. This is a pretty grim story for Pokemon, but it's only one of many. Pokemon has had this weird trend of ghosts randomly appearing in their games for some side quest where we learn about their depressing story, and you bet that more of these ghosts will be appearing. Butterfree Venomoth Switch This theory states the sprites for Butterfree and Venomoth were switched during the creation of the Generation 1 games. This is due to how the Pokemon seem to break the design trends of their respective lines, and fit better when switching lines. For example, Caterpie and Metapod clearly have more human-like white eyes with dark pupils, but when it evolves into Butterfree, they just become red compound eyes? And the opposite happens with the Venomoth line. Venonat's red compound eyes turn into Venomoth's white eyes with dark pupils. While Metapod evolving into Venomoth is plausible but not convincing, Venonat evolving into Butterfree makes too much sense. Alongside the aforementioned eyes, they share the same nose and fangs, antenna, hands, feet, and color scheme even. This makes too much sense. I think that Venonat evolving to Butterfree was actually a thing, at least during some part of development. Ditto are failed Mew clones. Another popular theory, this one states that the Pokemon Ditto are failed attempts to clone the mythical Mew. We know that in the Generation 1 game, scientists worked on cloning Mew, and eventually succeeded by creating the bioweapon Mewtwo. However, Mewtwo is only referred to as the first successful clone of Mew, not the first clone of Mew. The similarities between Mew and Ditto are too much to dismiss. First of all, Mew is considered the progenitor of all modern Pokemon. As such, it contains within it the DNA of all of their Pokemon. This isn't actually how DNA works, but I guess that's how it works in the Pokemon world. As such, Mew can learn to move Transform, which allows it to transform into any other Pokemon. The only other Pokemon to know this move is Ditto, whose whole gimmick is transforming into other Pokemon. Ditto and Mew are a similar shade of pinkish purple, and their shinies are also both bright blue. They are also both genderless and have an equal stat spread. The physical similarities definitely point to Ditto being an attempted clone. Also in the Gen 1 games, one of the places you could find Ditto was in the Pokemon Mansion. This was also where a lot of the scientists working on the Mewtwo project worked, considering the journal entries about the project found throughout the now abandoned mansion. With all this evidence, I think this theory is true. It's definitely implied that Ditto were failed Mew clones. Blue's Raticate died. In the Generation 1 games, your rival Blue uses a Rattata, later evolving into Eradicate. However, around halfway into the game, he stops using Eradicate. The last time we see him using it is during battle on the SS Han. And the next time we see him after that is in the battle at the Pokemon Tower, where dead Pokemon are buried. And here, his Raticate is missing. Before he initiates the battle, he asks us why we are even there, as our Pokemon aren't dead. Of course, this led many to theorize that Blue's Raticate had died, perhaps even as a result of the previous battle, which is why he was at the Pokemon Tower to mourn his lost Pokemon. And this is certainly possible. After all, these very games have the plotline of the dead Marowak, so dead Pokemon is an idea Game Freak was willing to include in the games. However, I personally choose not to believe in this theory. If you look at the full dialogue of Blue at Pokemon Tower, he still keeps his mean-spirited tone that he has throughout the game, not a more somber tone that you'd expect him to have when mourning his Pokemon. Also, Blue's mission is to catch lots of Pokemon so he would have lots of strong Pokemon for his team. He had Eradicate earlier because that was one of the only options available to him, and it worked pretty well for the early game because Eradicate works when you're at lower levels. However, Eradicate does fall off around the mid-game, and this was around that point. Blue simply had better Pokemon to use, so why would he continue using a weak Raticate? He probably just boxed it. But with that being said, there's enough evidence here that justifies believing his Raticate did die, but I personally don't think that was the case. Game Timelines The timelines of the games are something that 
aren't really elaborated on in the games themselves, yet we can figure out a vague timeline from information that we can infer. The first thing to note is that there are multiple timelines. How complex we want to go is completely up to the individual. For example, technically the different game versions are part of different timelines, as events happen slightly differently in each version, mainly regarding the legendary. And if we take this logic to the extreme, every individual save file ever is its own timeline, as the choices players make in each save file are different, thus creating a new set of events. However, for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to assume that different versions released concurrently are, are just one point in the timeline, they're the same. Canonically, there are two timelines, the Mega Timeline and the Non-Mega Timeline. The Non-Mega Timeline consists of the games without Mega Evolutions. In this timeline, the Gen 1 and 3 games take place at the same time, and three years later, the Gen 2 and 4 games takes place at the same time. An unknown amount of years later, Pokemon Black and White take place, and two years after that, Black and White 2 occur. So that's all we know about the non-Mega Timeline. In the Mega Timeline, we have the Gen 3 remakes Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and the second set of Gen 1 remakes Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, the Gen 6 games Pokemon X and Y, and the Gen 7 games Sun, Moon, Ultra Sun, and Ultra Moon. There are several differences in events between the timelines beyond the obvious Mega Evolutions. In Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, you're able to intercept the meteor carrying Deoxys while it's still in space, while in the original timeline, the meteor crashed onto the planet. Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee also have a slight timeline shift, as the characters Chase, Elaine, and Trace are the ones to undergo the traditional Kanto story, beating Team Rocket and whatnot. Originally, the characters Red, Green, and Blue do this back in the non-Mega Timeline, but Red, Green, and Blue still exist in the Mega Timeline, they just had their journeys a couple years before and didn't stop Team Rocket. And now we get to the tough part. The Gen 8 and 9 games, as well as the Gen 4 remakes, don't really have Megas in them, so we're not really sure whether they're part of the Mega Timeline or not. However, the Dex entries in some of those games do reference Mega Evolution, even though Mega Evolution itself doesn't exist in those games, so we can probably safely say that they're in the Mega Timeline, but, you know, the fact that Pokemon is never going to come back to Mega Evolutions kind of makes the timeline of all the future games kind of confusing. With that being said, though, we can put the Gen 4 remakes around the same spot in the Mega Timeline as the original Gen 4 games in the non-Mega Timeline. Additionally, Legends Arceus can be put around 100 years before the Gen 1 games. And with all this, we can assume the events of the timeline stay relatively the same, even though we don't see them. For example, there's probably a version of the Gen 5 games that happen in the Mega Timeline, considering that Grimsley exists, and a version of the Gen 6 games that happen in the non-Mega Timeline. Okay, I think I got everything. That was super complicated, and honestly warrants a whole video on its own. Fallers. Fallers are another recurring concept in Pokemon games, and it actually kind of ties in with the messy timeline stuff we talked about in the previous entry. While what exactly constitutes a faller is up in the air, I think a good definition is someone who passes through a wormhole and loses their memory. In universe, the International Police defines fallers simply as people who pass through ultra wormholes, which causes the energy of the wormholes to basically linger on around them, attracting ultra beasts. However, not everybody who passes through a wormhole loses their memory, so I'm going to define Faller specifically as someone who loses their memory. Chronologically, the first Faller we encounter is Looker in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Looker is an international police agent first appearing in Pokemon Platinum and later appearing in Black and White. However, in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, the first games chronologically in the Mega Timeline, he shows washed up on the shores of Hoenn, losing all of his memory. Since then, he later shows up in X and Y as well as Sun and Moon. Several years later in X and Y, he shows up to hunt down Team Flare admin Zerosik. We don't know if he interfered with the events of that generation's Gen 4 and 5 like in the original universe. In X and Y, he tries to distance himself from the International Police, although we didn't know why yet. However, this is later explained in the Gen 7 games. Ten years before the Gen 7 games, Looker was on a mission with his partners, Nanu and another unnamed woman, who was also a follower herself. They were to hunt down the Ultra Beast Guzzlord. However, Looker messed up on the mission, which resulted in the unnamed female officer being killed by Guzzlord. However, Looker found out afterwards that the International Police sent the killed woman as bait, as she was a follower and would attract Ultra Beasts. However, after the events of the mission, he and Nanu find the second follower we talk about, Annabelle. Annabelle was found unconscious on the beaches of Pony Island, similar to how Looker was found. She had also lost a memory of her previous life and later joined the International Police 
with Looker. While she may not remember herself before coming to Alola, we do. Annabelle used to be a salon maiden in Hoenn, the boss of one of the battle towers there. And we know that she comes from the non-Mega Timeline, because the Battle Tower doesn't exist in the Mega Timeline. But after joining the International Police, Annabelle quickly rises through the ranks, becoming Looker's superior even. In the events of the Gen 7 game, she is assigned to the UB Task Force alongside Looker to contain the outbreak of Ultra Beasts in Alola. However, she quickly becomes exhausted as Ultra Beasts are constantly attacking her due to her being a faller. It's likely that the reason why Looker sticks close to her is because she reminds him of the agent that died, and he doesn't want her to meet the same fate. After the Ultra Beasts are contained, she vacations in Alola and takes a liking to the battle tree, calling it nostalgic somewhat. Of course, this is because she's used to battle facilities, even subconsciously. The next follower is also from Gen 7, and his name is Moan. Moan is a man who spends his time on Pokepelago. He used to be the husband of Luzamine and the father of Gladion and Lily. He was a scientist at the Aether Foundation and disappeared during an experiment with an ultra wormhole and was presumed dead afterwards. However, in Sun and Moon, we find him on Pokepelago where he's just relaxing with no memory of his previous life. There's a certain dark humor in that Moan is just chilling on Pokepelago farming beans while his disappearance completely destroyed his family back in Alola and caused lifelong trauma in all of them. In Ultra Sun and Moon, he returns to Alola and tours the Aether facility where he meets Luzamine. When Luzamine sees that he's still alive, she's happy, but but since he lost his memories and doesn't remember her, she accepts that and she lets him go. There are two more followers introduced in Legends Arceus. The first is a player character, depending on whether you choose the male or female character. They are heavily implied to be the protagonist character from the Gen 4 games, who were sent back in time by Arceus to bring balance to the Thinnoh of 100 years ago, called Hisui, and stop the character Volo from destroying it since literally nobody from that time period was strong enough to stop him. The second follower is Ingo. Ingo was a trainer from the Unova region who managed the battle subway along his brother Emmett. Sometime after the events of Black and White 2, he falls through a wormhole to Hisui, losing most of his memories. He later becomes a warden of the Pearl Clan and assists the player in their journey, often reminiscing about flashes of memory from back in Unova. As of right now, these are all the followers in the franchise, but it is possible that we end up seeing more in the future. Team Rocket killed Marowak. I mean, this is less of a theory and more of a fact. In the Gen 1 games, when trying to capture Pokemon to illegally sell, they come across a Cubone and its mother Marowak. The Marowak fought the Rocket member so that her baby could run away, which resulted in the Rocket member killing her. According to the Pokemon Origins anime, which supposedly is canon to the games, the Rocket member killed her by literally clubbing her to death, which is a disturbing image to think about. In the games, the ghost of Marowak haunts Lavender Town, and you use a soapscope to finally let it pass on in peace by defeating it again? In the Mega Timeline, your rival Trace actually takes the orphaned Cubone and makes it a part of his team, raising it, which I think is a really cool touch. Lumia City Ghost Girl Another example of a ghost in Pokemon, and probably the most famous one. In the second story of a certain building in Lumia City, a ghost will appear from the elevator and float towards you. She will look at you and say, no, you're not the one, before disappearing. Now this led to many theories being spread about this so-called ghost girl. My favorite has to come from YouTuber Drogane. Basically, this theory takes a look at the Japan-only official website called Pokemon Horror. This website was styled like a blog written by somebody who actually lives in Kalos, and was published around the same time as Generation 6's release. The website was ran by somebody who was obsessed with ghosts and ghost stories. I'm not going to explain the full thing here since it would take too long, but the gist of it is that the Lumio City Ghost Girl is not a real ghost, but rather a hoax set up by the owner of this website. In Generations, we see that the Holocaster, a technology created by Lysander, is able to project a near-perfect image of an actual person as a hologram. The Holocaster became widespread in Kalos, almost as ubiquitous there as smartphones are in our world. So the website owner had a Holocaster and decided to set up a hoax where when someone entered this specific room, she'd play a very realistic hologram of someone pretending to be a ghost. The idea was that people would talk about this ghost and discussions about ghosts would become more widespread, leading to more traffic to her website and interest in her hobby. GS Ball the GS Ball is a special Pokeball. It either stands for Greatest Smith's Ball or Gold Silver Ball. In Pokemon Crystal, this ball was tied to a special event that allowed for the player to summon and catch Celebi. More notably, the GS Ball was also a huge part of the Johto Saga in the Pokemon anime. 
It was built up as this huge mystery, only to be suddenly dropped and never mentioned again. In a 2000 interview with Masamitsu Hisaka, a director of the Pokemon anime, he said that the GS ball was originally going to contain a Celebi that would play a huge part in the Johto saga. However, as Celebi was later decided to be the star of the movie Pokemon Forever, they dropped the storyline in the anime. He literally said that they just hoped that the audience would just forget about the GS ball, which is hilarious. Wally has asthma. Wally is a recurring rival character in the Generation 3 games and the remakes. His family says that he is sick and Wally himself coughs a lot. Later on in the game, we see that Wally moves to Verdanturf Town to live with his aunt and uncle because the air there is cleaner. With this information in mind, it seems logical to assume that Wally has asthma and the ash from Mount Chimney was being blown to where he originally lived and caused issues with his breathing, which is why he moved to Verdanturf, where the ash isn't being blown to. N is a Zoroark. Another popular Pokemon theory, this one suggests that N from the Gen 5 games is actually a Zoroark. This theory is actually a pretty strong one. We see in the games that Zoroark are able to disguise themselves as humans and even talk while in this form, meaning that one could easily blend into human society. Second, in Black and White 2, we can trigger flashbacks by talking to certain characters. All the flashbacks are from the point of view of that character. When we trigger a flashback by talking to a Zoroark, the flashback is from the perspective of N. Also, in Black and White 2, we follow a Zoroark on Victory Road to enter N's castle. However, when we enter the castle, the Zoroark is nowhere to be seen, only N is. Additionally, N talked about learning how to be human when he was younger, and Getsus calls him a freak without a human heart. I always thought that human here meant being like a kind, sociable person, but I guess it could take a more literal interpretation. Additionally, N's hairstyle is similar to Zoroark's, and N can literally talk to Pokemon. Also, there's this really small detail. In Japanese culture, it's said that yokai, which are basically monsters that can disguise themselves as human, and that many Pokemon are based off of, usually have a strange speaking pattern, sometimes speaking slowly or really, really quickly. In the Generation 5 games, no matter what your tech speed is set at, N always speaks really quickly, which means that he has a strange speech pattern compared to other normal humans. So it's also another piece of evidence for N being a Zoroark as it's implied with this text stuff that he's not human. With all this in mind, I wouldn't blame you for believing this theory. Hydreigon hates Getsus. Getsus is infamous for his strangely underleveled ace, Hydreigon. In black and white, this Hydreigon had a well-balanced special moveset, which played to its strengths and made it a serious threat. However, in black and white 2, his Hydreigon now has a physical set, which is strange considering Hydreigon is weak physically. This new moveset contains Frustration, a move which increases in power the less friendship you have with that Pokemon. And disturbingly, Frustration is at its max power on Hydreigon, meaning that Getsus' Hydreigon literally is at the lowest friendship stat possible. So, this goes to show just how terrible Getsus is as a person, as having the Pokemon you presumably trained for years as your ace literally have no friendship towards you means that you're doing some very terrible things to it. But this makes sense, Getsus is probably the most evil person we've seen in Pokemon ever. He only sees people in Pokemon as tools to achieve his personal ambitions, even abusing and grooming his son N for his own gain. Of course he would be abusive to his Pokemon as well. And before enduring black and white, he was still evil, but he was a smart mastermind. After his defeat at the end of these games, he most likely got consumed by rage and completely went insane. This is probably why his Hydreigon went from having an optimal moveset to one that made no sense. And sadly, going crazy with anger meant that he took it out on his Pokemon worse than he already did. Game Freak Leaks Information so yeah, Pokemon conspiracy that applies to the real world. This states that all the leaks that we see surface before the release of a new game are actually released by Game Freak through third parties who act unaffiliated with the company. But why would they leak their own game? Well, as a form of marketing. Typically, companies will crack down on people leaking their content due to maintaining privacy and integrity. And this makes sense, you probably don't want sensitive information to leak. However, with Pokemon, most of the major leaks are just how the new Pokemon look. The new Pokemon are always the biggest marketing tool for the release of the new game, so it's not impossible that they are leaking some new Pokemon on the down low. The marketing power of leaks is best shown recently with Scarlet and Violet. For whatever reason, Game Freak decided not to reveal many new Pokemon before its release. I personally was not too hyped because I didn't know what many Pokemon would look like. 
However, in the days leading up to Scarlet and Violet's release, the entire decks would slowly be leaked to the public, and people went wild over these. It really felt like they only showed the most boring designs in the trailers because the leaked designs were so much cooler. So many people, including myself and my friends, got so much more hyped for the game after seeing the leaked decks. So yeah, maybe Game Freak could be leaking some of these images to generate hype. It's not unheard of. For example, people who keep up with Fortnite leaks know that some of the major leakers in the community are in contact with Epic Games, and typically only leak stuff Epic allows them to. And that makes sense here too, Game Freak would probably be okay with images of Pokemon being leaked. On the other hand, I doubt the leakers dumping the game ROMs are sanctioned by Game Freak. One big problem faces this theory though, why wouldn't Game Freak just release the images officially? More trailers could easily show off the Pokemon, and trailers will also get a lot more buzz and reach a lot more people. For all the hype the leaks generated, I doubt even a hundred thousand or a million people saw them. On the other hand, Pokemon trailers easily get millions of views. Also, people who leak images are quickly silenced by Game Freak, which runs counterintuitive to this theory. So I'm going to call BS. It doesn't make sense when you take a step back and look at the whole situation. However, Despite going through all this, I will go on a side tangent and tell you about a true story of when unsubstantiated leaks were actually kind of confirmed by none other than Junichi Masuda, one of the founders and current chief creative officer of Game Freak. In 2016, in the months th during the lead up to Pokemon Sun and Moon's release, people were speculating as to what the evolutions of the starters would be. As always, fake leaks were being thrown around left and right, and it was especially crazy back then. Amongst the various leaks being thrown around, these images surfaced on the internet. People initially assumed that these were fake as they were completely unsubstantiated and according to many, not believable whatsoever. However, as more information was released about the games, these leaks started to become more credible. In October of 2016, something incredible happened. Reddit user El Straw Fedora and his friend had the opportunity to attend a meet and greet with Junichi Masuda. Masuda would also autograph stuff people brought to him. So El Straw Fedora decided to draw the Sun and Moon protagonist alongside the three leaked starter evolutions, which weren't revealed officially at the time. His friend was the one to go to the table and get it signed, and when he showed Masuda the drawing, he started to laugh and ask about the drawing. He told the guy his friend was very talented to draw this. They were not sure as to what Masuda said next since they weren't native Japanese speaker, but they think that he said that these haven't been officially released yet. He then autographed it afterwards. So yeah, while this technically isn't a confirmation, it is really funny how Masuda himself autographed leaks. Infinity Energy Infinity energy is basically the in-universe term for the type of energy that is derived from the life energy of Pokemon. The first instance of this was AZ's super weapon in the Kalos War 3000 years ago, which used the life energy of many Pokemon. It is also theorized by Professor Sycamore that infinity energy is what created the Mega Stones, and the energy contained within the stones allow Pokemon to have so much energy that they temporarily evolve further than they naturally would. In the Hoenn region, the Devon Corporation got rich by harnessing infinity energy, eventually using it in practical applications across the region. However, it's likely that the common person in Hoenn doesn't know that infinity energy comes from the life force of Pokemon. Mimikyu's True Form Mimikyu is a ghost type Pokemon that is a fan favorite for being very cute. However, what we see isn't the true Mimikyu, it's a disguise that it created and donned to hide its true form. Mimikyu wanted people to love it, and it saw how Pikachu was beloved, so it copied Pikachu, and if the Pokemon community is any indication, its hopes to be loved was fulfilled. However, Mimikyu's true form is apparently so horrible that people will literally die upon seeing it. Seriously, its Pokedex entry says that a trainer who accidentally saw its true form went home and died painfully that very night. This could be exaggerated, but you probably don't want to find out for yourself. Arceus True Form Arceus is the god of all existence in the Pokemon world. He literally created everything. So many people found it weird that you're even able to capture it in a Pokeball, and that it's not even the strongest Pokemon in the game. However, a theory is that the Arceus we see is just a weaker avatar he sends to the mortal realm. This theory has been around for a while, and was actually confirmed in Legends Arceus. When you finish the game and defeat Arceus in battle, he explicitly says that he will give you a part of himself as a reward, to see the world how the trainer sees it. And this part of himself is just the Pokemon Arceus. So yes, the Arceus in game is just a fraction of its true form. But what does this true form look like? I'm a personal fan of the theory that the beta form of Arceus is actually what the real Arceus looks like. 
it's this ethereal, almost incomprehensible design. Like, yeah, it looks goofy as pixel art, but imagine seeing this in motion in real life, it would be horrifying. It also kind of looks like a nebula, which is where stars are created, and it, that fits the whole creation god motif. There are also several other theories about what the true form of Arceus is, so we will get into those later. Dex entries are incorrect. So I've already referred to Pokedex entries being potentially over-exaggerated with Mimikyu, but there are a bunch of other examples of ridiculous Pokedex entries. Most famously is the Macargo Dex entry, which states that its body temperature is 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit. For reference, the surface of the sun is around 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, I don't think that's actually true. Also, in real life, lava is only around 2,000 degrees hot, so it's not like it has a basis in reality. Another ridiculous example is Lantern. One of its Pokedex entries stated the light that it emits is so bright that it can illuminate the surface of the ocean from a depth of 3 miles. I won't go into the full calculation here, but with the way water diffuses light, the amount of energy that Lantern would need to produce to illuminate the surface from a depth of 3 miles would probably be enough to boil the entire ocean. More ridiculous dex entries come from a champ. One says that it can punch 1,000 times in 2 seconds. Even after dividing that number between its four arms, that's still 125 punches a second. It's also able to throw people so far that they pass over the horizon, which is also crazy. But I would be lying if I didn't say this sort of thing didn't happen all the time in Pokemon. Overall, most people tend to believe that the Pokedex isn't actually factual, but rather full of rumors, myths, and just incorrect information. Some people believe that this is because children are filling out the Pokedex. For example, they see that McCargo is hot, and for their dex entry, they'll just make up a stupidly big number for how hot its temperature is. But I'd actually never thought that the kids themselves were filling out the Pokedex. Like, we know that adults like Professor Laventon were writing dex entries long ago. I just assumed that filling out the Pokedex was just necessary to digitize the already existing paper encyclopedias of Pokemon. But I do think the important part of the Pokedex is just the biological information, and that the actual entries are just author's notes by whoever's filling it out, which makes them more personal anecdotes and thoughts rather than actual facts. Underneath Diglett, Diglett is a Pokemon that's always seen burrowing underground. However, we've never seen it fully outside the ground. This has led to a lot of speculation as to what the rest of its body looks like. Of course, there have been a bunch of memes where he's like a buff dude or something else comedic. There have also been more horrific interpretations of what he looks like. However, Diglett is based off of a mole, which means that it probably just has a mole-like body with little hands and feet underneath. Sam is Professor Oak. Sam is a character in the fourth Pokemon movie. He's a child from 40 years in the past who Celebi teleported to the present day. He met with Ash and his group and joined them on a journey while drawing in a sketchbook he had. At the end, he found Celebi again and was teleported back to the past. At the end of the movie, Ash tells Professor Oak about how he was sad that his friend left. Oak tells Ash that he and Sam would remain friends forever. Ash is confused as he never actually told Oak Sam's name. Oak then looks at an old, worn-out version of Sam's sketchbook. So yeah, it's heavily implied and basically just confirmed that Sam is a younger Professor Oak. I mean, we know that his full name is Samuel Oak, so it makes sense that a younger version of himself would be referred to as Sam. Also, Sam's sketchbook can be seen in Oak's lab in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, which is a fun reference. Anime Cyrus Fate Cyrus is the main villain of the fourth generation of Pokemon. He believes that emotion is a flaw in existence and wants to destroy the current universe and create a new universe with no emotion. In the anime, he got really close to this goal, using Dialga and Palkia, the gods of time and space, to create this new dimension. However, he lost control of the two, and the portal to the new world started to fade. Cyrus stepped through by himself before the portal closed. Dialga and Palkia later destroyed the new dimension, presumably killing Cyrus within. However, this got retconned later, as it was revealed that this dimension still exists. However, we don't know if Cyrus is still alive or not. This makes Cyrus the first villain in the main Pokemon anime to be killed if he died in there, which is very likely. Gary's 10 Badges In the Pokemon anime, Gary shows off to Ash by showing him 10 badges. Now, this is strange considering that there are only 8 gyms in the Kanto League. This has led to a bunch of memes and potential theories, but the real answer here is that there are more gyms that we don't see in the game or in the anime that Gary beat, or it's just an animation error. The Disc Pokemon In the Scarlet and Violet books of Generation 9, the author Heath writes about a strange disc-shaped Pokemon. 
There was speculation about what this was, but with the DLC announcement, this Pokemon is most likely Terrapagos. I mean, it is Terrapagos. However, I am still excited to see how it fits into the lore of Gen 9 as a whole, as there's a lot of interesting theories floating around about it bringing dreams to life. Verity is Cynthia's daughter. Verity is a character in the 20th Pokemon movie, I Choose You. She comes from Twinleaf Town in Sinnoh and has Piplup as her starter. She said that her mother was a strong, famous trainer who didn't really have time for her, and that she felt bad because she didn't live up to the expectations of her mother. In the movie, we see a picture of Verity's mother, who looks almost exactly like Cynthia. I mean, it totally is Cynthia, they have the same exact hairstyle and side profile. And the rest of Verity's description matches her. Cynthia is a champion of Sinnoh, who would be a famous, strong trainer from Verity's home region. Also, we know that Cynthia is very interested in the mythology of Sinnoh, so it would make sense that she would name her daughter after one of the three lakes of Sinnoh. However, the film's director, Kunihiko Yuyama, explicitly debunked this theory, saying that her mother wasn't Cynthia. So yes, this is a false theory, but to be honest, Cynthia not being Verity's mother is completely ridiculous. Like, if you meant for that to be the case, why not use like literally any other design for a mother other than one who looks exactly like Cynthia? Maybe she has a twin or something we don't know about. Paradox Pokemon are imagined. Paradox Pokemon are a new category of Pokemon introduced in Scarlet and Violet. In the game, they are currently presented as Pokemon that come through a time machine from either the past or future, based on the game you're playing. However, there's a lot of things that don't add up here. For example, almost all the Paradox Pokemon come from different works of fiction as described by the magazine A Culture, which took information from the Scarlet and Violet books. It's weird that these Pokemon, once discovered, looked exactly like these famous works of fiction. Like how weird would it be if we discovered that aliens existed, but this hypothetical alien civilization was exactly like the Star Wars Empire? That would definitely raise some eyebrows. Additionally, some of the Paradox Pokemon were reported in the Scarlet and Violet books, which were written before the time machine itself was invented. Also, in the Scarlet and Violet books, the speculation about walking wake and iron leaves were explicitly stated just to be the author's speculation, not an actual report on something they saw. So how convenient that decades later, Pokemon resembling this creative writing exercise just so happened to exist. Also, a lot of the Paradox Pokemon themselves defy logic, especially the prehistoric Pokemon. For example, Sandy Shocks, a Pokemon supposedly from before humanity existed, has man-made components like screws and magnets in its body. And Screamtail, the paradox past form of uh, Jigglypuff, supposedly predates cellular life in the universe, which just makes no sense whatsoever. Almost everything about these creatures are contradictory, which is why they're called Paradox Pokemon. The theory here states that Paradox Pokemon are actually imaginary creatures brought to life by the legendary Disk Pokemon who lives under Area Zero. We know that previous explorers have mentioned that they think the disc-shaped legendary is somehow messing with their minds, reading it and probing it. Also, we know that Professor Sada and Turo were huge fans of a culture magazine and the Scarlet and Violet books, so of course they had these predetermined biases of what they thought a Pokemon from the future and the Pokemon from the past would look like. And then the disc Pokemon took those creatures from their imaginations and brought them to life. At this point, I think the fact that Paradox Pokemon are imaginary is all but confirmed because Game Freak specifically left so many hints pointing to this, and this fact will likely be confirmed in the DLC. Ash's Father Identity The identity of Ash's dad is left unknown. This is probably because the Pokemon games, for the most part, have the protagonist's dad missing, and also due to the fact that missing fathers tend to be an anime trope in general. While officially never revealed, this hasn't stopped people from throwing around theories about who his dad is, which range from side characters to Professor Oak to... Mr. Mime? We'll cover some of these theories more in depth later down the iceberg. South America is real. This refers to the fact that South America is an actual place referred to in Pokemon Generation 1, as researcher notes state that this is where they found Mew. In Generation 1, a lot of real-world places are referenced, like the nation America, India, and even the Kanto region is supposed to be the actual region of Kanto in Japan. Like I said in the entry about the Pokemon War, this is likely because Game Freak didn't actually intend for there to be a Pokemon world when they first started the franchise, it was just supposed to be the real world. So I don't think South America actually exists canonically, but it's likely that we do see a South American region sometime in the future. 
Liko related to Ash. Liko is the protagonist of the new Pokemon anime series, Pokemon Horizons. Horizons is notable because it's the first time the main anime dropped Ash as a protagonist and instead has a new character as a protagonist, something fans have been wanting for a long time. However, people speculated that Liko is actually related to Ash, and a popular theory was that she was Ash's daughter. Some people said that she looks like a mix between Ash and Serena, a character from the X and Y anime series that was basically the closest thing Ash got to a canonical love interest. Additionally, people pointed out that her hair clip is shaped like the logo on Ash's hat. Now, I don't actually watch the anime, and the only interaction I have with it is through some discussion online, so I can't speak for myself. But, according to my sources, the idea that the two are related is very unlikely based on the episodes we have so far. First of all, we've already seen her father, who is not Ash. Some people have said that she might be adopted, but that's just reaching at this point. Also, the symbols on Ash's hat is the symbol of the Pokemon League in the anime. It's a brand, so Liko can have a similarly branded hairpin. Claiming that the two are related because of this is like saying two people are related because they both wear Nike shoes. I'm calling debunked on this theory. I don't actually think the anime team would set Ash's role as a middle-aged father just yet. Based on the ending of Ash's series, they left it ambiguous enough, and I wouldn't be surprised if they bring him back as a main character or a very prominent side character if the new series flops and they want to bring him back. Next, Legends game. Pokemon Legends Arceus released in 2021 and was beloved by a lot of the Pokemon community. The game's unique playstyle compared to the rest of the Pokemon games, as well as the fact that it offered a unique perspective on the Sinnoh region by sending us over 100 years into its past, allowing us to play through the formative history of Sinnoh alongside the ancestors of beloved Pokemon characters, made it a very, very fun and refreshing game in the franchise. After the success of Legends Arceus, many fans wondered if there would be another Legends game. Legends Arceus was technically a spin-off game, not a main series game, so it's possible that it's just one and done. However, this hasn't stopped fans from speculating about another Legends game. One super popular idea is a Legends Celebi game taking place in the Johto region. The Johto games place a lot of emphasis on the historical events and culture of the region, meaning that they're ripe for a Legend-style prequel where we can see these myths play out for ourselves. A lot of people are a fan of this idea, and so am I, since it's been over a decade since we've seen Johto in a game. And even when we did see Johto before that, it tended to be overshadowed by people talking about the Kanto post-game. However, another thing to note is that the Legends Arceus came out around the same time as the Generation 4 remakes. So, if we keep the pattern going here, the next Legends game would come out around the same time as the Gen 5 remakes and take place in the Unova region, which means that it could possibly be some sort of Legends Victini or Legends Keldeo game. Unova similarly hints at an interesting historical past with the civil war caused by the twin princes jockeying for power after the death of their father, and such a game would be the perfect opportunity to show off the original dragon the original form of Reshiram, Zekrom, and Kurum that was split apart by the fighting between the princes. Personally, with this in mind, I think the next three Legends games were hinted at by the starters in Legends Arceus, as we have a Gen 2, Gen 5, and Gen 7 starter, so maybe we'll be seeing Legends Alola sometime as well. Type Null based on Arceus Type Null was a man-made, normal-type legendary Pokémon introduced in the Unova region. And it's theorized that like how Mewtwo was a man-made clone of Mew, Type Null was an attempt at creating a clone of God itself, Arceus. And I'm going to say that this theory is true. Type Null itself is a flawed clone, which is why it needed the mask to keep itself from going berserk. However, with enough friendship, it evolves into Silvalli, which is the true clone of Arceus. Like Arceus, Silvalli is a normal type who has equal distribution across all of its base stats. Additionally, like Arceus, it changes type based on what item it's currently holding. In its case, it changes to the type of the memory disk it's holding. And what is the ability called that allows it to change types? The RKS system, Arceus. This theory, in my eyes, is confirmed. Hunter J died. Hunter J was a private mercenary who would hunt down and capture Pokemon to illegally sell. In the Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum run of the anime, she was hired by Team Galactic to capture the Lake Trio legendaries. She successfully captures them and hands them over to Team Galactic, but as their airship leaves, a future site used by the Lake Trio before they were captured manages to hit the airship and critically damage its engines. Her ship crashes into a lake and sinks. If that wasn't morbid enough, we see the glass on the ship break and water rush in as the screams of the crew can be heard. While their deaths aren't explicitly shown due to the nature of the anime, 
The following scene showing the ship plummeting into the depths of the lake as Hunter J's glasses follow it down is enough confirmation. Yeah, she's dead alongside her entire crew, but honestly they were scumbags and deserved it. The scene becomes worse when you remember that the airship contained a bunch of innocent captured Pokemon who were stuck in cages. All of these Pokemon also drowned when the ship sank. Yeah, the like trio don't mess around. Pokemon Z Content Pokemon Z was the theorized third game to Pokemon X and Y. Now if you didn't know, Pokemon have a really scummy business practice that, in alongside releasing two almost identical games at once to boost sales, around a year after release they'll release an enhanced third version of the game that slightly differs from the previous two versions. This has been the case from all the way back in Generation 1. I understand why they decided to do it with red and green. They wanted to show off the feature of communication between Game Boys, and a good way to encourage that is to have version exclusives in two slightly different games so people could trade to truly catch them all. However, the practice now is completely frivolous because nobody actually trades with others in person anymore, it just becomes a hassle. Generation 1 technically had four games, but Pokemon Blue was just the American localization of green, so I don't really count that as a separate version. The true third game in the franchise was Pokemon Yellow, which, granted, does differ more than the usual third game in that it was based off the anime. However, in all likelihood, this game was probably Game Freak slightly modifying the code of Red and Green as a quick cash grab to milk as much as they can off the 90s Pokemon hype train. And since then, this tradition has continued for almost all the generations, because they know Pokemon fans will buy them regardless. Don't get me wrong, the third games are usually the best of the generation. Games like Emerald and Platinum were massive improvements over the games that preceded them. However, the question is why wasn't the improved content in these games just included in the base game to begin with? And also, the enhanced versions of the game still have missing Pokemon that you need to trade with the base versions to get. If I'm buying an enhanced, definitive version of a game, I should expect all the Pokemon in it. But anyways, Pokemon followed this model for the first four generations. In Generation 5, they actually did something unique, which is rather than give us an almost identical enhanced version, they gave us full-blown sequels in Black and White 2 that were, for all intents and purposes, completely separate games just running on the same engine. This was really cool and set a good precedent for the franchise going forward. But of course, the, since the community vehemently hated Generation 5 back when it was released, this scared Game Freak from ever doing anything interesting with Pokemon games ever again, because they learned that the Pokemon community hates it when he tries something new, and that giving them Pikachu and Charizard is enough to make them buy the games. In Gen 7, they returned to enhanced versions, but this time they didn't just release one, but two enhanced versions with Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. This was particularly egregious, but I will let it slide because in my opinion, Ultra Sun and Moon are great games and are in the running for best Pokemon games, period. And starting in Gen 8, they did away with the enhanced versions entirely, instead replacing it with DLC, which you can add on to your current game, which I'm not sure if it's better or worse than enhanced versions. Ultimately, the stuff in the DLC should have been in the original game, but if you think Game Freak is capable of creating an industry standard game, I have a bridge to sell. That rant aside, all of this was supposed to be context for Pokemon Z. Pokemon X and Y were unique in that they got literally nothing to follow up on the original release of the games. No sequels, third version, anything. People were expecting either a Pokemon Z or even an X and Y too. However, Pokemon Z was the main idea people had. When Zygarde Complete was revealed, people thought that this would be the new form of the third legendary the third game would revolve around, like how Platinum had Origin Garantina and Black and White 2 had the Kyurem forms. Additionally, the anime's new arc was called Pokemon X, Y, and Z, and had a strong emphasis on the Zygarde cell forms. Additionally, Pokemon X and Y had unused moves called 1000 Arrows and 1000 Waves, which were signature moves of Zygarde that it didn't have access to yet. This was similar to Kyurem's signature moves in Black and White that were also unused, but became accessible in Black and White too. The stage seemed set for a Pokemon Z in 2015. However, no game came in 2015. This was interesting, as in the West, one new Pokemon game released every year since Red and Blue. 2015 was literally the first year since the beginning of the franchise that no new Pokemon game released. So why was this? So why was this? Well, most people think that a Pokemon Z was considered by Game Freak, but due to the upcoming Pokemon 20th anniversary, Game Freak decided to put their focus on the Generation 7 games, which were meant to be much more of a celebration of the series as a whole, rather than just remaking the Gen 6 games. 
So what would be the cut content in Pokemon Z? Alongside the new Zygarde content, which would be added in Sun and Moon, we also might have an expansion of the power plant area in the Lumia Spadlands, which are infamously underutilized. The Korraway Town train station could have also led somewhere in Z. Pokemon Z may have also added more Mega Evolutions. I don't think people would complain about more Megas, and it would be nice if Megas were given to more Gen 6 Pokemon like the starters. It's pretty inexcusable that the only Gen 6 Pokemon that can Mega Evolve is the mythical Pokemon Diancie. Additionally, they could have given the Elite Four and maybe even Gym Leaders actual Mega Pokemon to use. It's pretty ridiculous that despite Megas being the cool new gimmick of Gen 6, hardly any bosses in Kalos use it. Also, Pokemon Z may have had the event for AZ's Floette, which was in the code for X and Y, but never actually added to any of the games. So yeah, there are a lot of potential stuff to be added to Kalos, and I hope that this region is revisited in the future and explored to its fullest potential. Shadow Triad Identities The Shadow Triad are these ninjas that work for Team Plasma. Like their name suggests, they are triplets. However, their identity became an interesting point of discussion following Black and White. You see, in the climax of Black and White, all the gym leaders show up to fight Team Plasma, all except for the trio of the first gym leaders, Chili, Cress, and Silen. Now, this is already quite suspicious, and most people consider that the Shadow Triad were these three gym leaders working for Team Plasma. However, this theory was seemingly debunked in Black and White 2, where a flashback showed that, that while the rest of the gym leaders were fighting Team Plasma at Ends Castle, the Shadow Triad were fighting three gym leaders elsewhere. So debunked, right? Well, not quite. We have to consider that the person recounting these events is Silen himself, so he may be lying about what happened because he isn't going to tell the protagonist that he's a part of Team Plasma. As an additional piece of trivia, in the Pokemon Adventures manga, the masks of the Shadow Triad match the facial patterns of the elemental monkeys, the aces of Silent, Crest, and Chili. But the Adventures manga is a completely different continuity story-wise, so that's not evidence for the games. But regardless, it's unlikely that we're ever going to see the Shadow Triad again outside the Gen 5 remakes, so this theory is most likely debunked based on in-game information. And even if it is true, which I believe it is, Game Freak didn't do anything with it, no plot twist or anything. Looking back at all the Pokemon games in general, there are just so many missed opportunities and it would be awesome to go back and allow them to reach their full potential. That should be what remakes do, but unfortunately Game Freak doesn't have that mindset. <laughs> Pokemon are energy beings. This theory states that Pokemon aren't really biological animals, but rather energy that can temporarily convert into material form. The crux of this theory is that when Pokemon enter and exit Pokeballs, they seem to convert into some sort of light. Also, they can be stored in PCs, meaning that they probably have some sort of non-material form. Of course, this contradicts the fact that some media says that Pokemon shrink to fit inside Pokeballs, but the idea of that making sense is dubious, even if the games say it outright. This theory states that Pokeballs are able to basically force a Pokemon's ability to convert from matter to energy and vice versa. This is why humans can't be caught in Pokeballs, because they aren't energy creatures, as well as Pokemon that are knocked out, since they can't convert if they're unconscious. Never mind the fact that Pokemon that get knocked out in battle return to their trainer's Pokeball, but you can say that in that case they return to the last second before unconsciousness, where wild Pokemon usually are completely knocked out by the time you throw a ball at them. This theory also states why Pokemon attacks work. A lot of attacks can be explained biologically. For example, it's not unreasonable to think that Charizard has an organ that produces fire to attack. However, some attacks don't make sense. For example, Swift is a weird one. Star shapes just randomly appear out of nowhere? However, if we take the energy theory into consideration, we can deduce that Pokemon convert energy into matter, the stars, and then throw those at the opponent to damage them. This also explains Pokemon types. Rather than being a biological classification, types are simply the type of energy the Pokemon is created from. After all, in the TCG, type cards are called energy cards. And the sudden evolution is just Pokemon gaining so much energy that they can transform into a more powerful form. In my opinion, this theory is a bit too far-fetched to be true. I do think Pokemon are supposed to be analogous to biological animals or various mythological monsters that would exist physically, not as some energy form. But to be honest, it's not the worst fan theory ever. Volo is a time traveler. This theory states that Volo, like the player, is a time traveler, but not one who traveled back in time, but one who traveled forwards. Volo is a strange character in Pokemon Legends Arceus, a seemingly innocent merchant, until he reveals that he was actually pulling the strings alongside Giratina to reach his goal of killing Arceus and creating a new world. Now, there's a few pieces of evidence to support this. First of all, space-time rifts were known to the people of Hisui. 
This means that they definitely existed in the past of Hisui, meaning that there were time travelers in Hisui's past. Is it possible that Volo was the time traveler from long ago who used a space-time rift to travel to the time of Legends Arceus? Volo always knew more than he should have when it came to ancient Sinnoh. He knew all the legends and myths and stories behind the ruins of Hisui, even when the others didn't. During the final battle with him, he wears this interesting outfit that we don't see in the rest of the game. It looks more like something from a Greco-Roman civilization rather than clothing from the Victorian era where Legends Arceus takes place. This clothing would match the time period of when the ruins of Hisui would originate. And interestingly, even though it is old clothing, it doesn't look worn out. It looks brand new. Maybe these were the clothes Volo traveled to the future in. These clothes were likely the clothes of the Celestica people, the ancient people of Hisui. While they were a prosperous civilization thousands of years ago, they fell into decline and their descendants became few in number. One other descendant of the Celestica people is Kogita. Unlike Volo, Kogita is dressed in period appropriate clothing and strangely enough doesn't know Volo well. They know each other, but if Volo was truly another descendant of the Celestica people like Kogita, they probably would have known each other their whole lives. Unless if Volo just happened to appear recently as he time traveled, and he was only able to find Kogita's secret village because he would have known where it was, coming from the past when the village wasn't secret. So how was Volo able to time travel? Well, we know that he was in cahoots with Giratina, and it's likely that he, that he had the same ambitions in the time when he came from. It's likely that his plans were foiled by the ancient hero, and when he was cornered, Giratina took him to the future so he could escape. But in Legends Arceus, he meets the protagonist, another time traveler, and is intrigued by them. He follows them around and allows them to collect all the legendary plates for him, as to not draw suspicion to himself. And then finally, he tries to overpower the player using his team and Garatina to get them to hand over the plates, allowing Volo to complete his plan. However, the player defeats him and Volo concedes defeat, respecting the strength of the player. However, in the most damning piece of evidence so far, he says that he would keep trying to achieve his goals, no matter how many years, decades, or even centuries it would take him. After this, he is not seen again. Maybe we will see him in another modern Pokemon game, trying to complete his plans again. Ash is in a coma. Well, we had to get to this eventually. This is just a stereotypical theory that comes up in basically every fandom about the nature of the series, to the point where it's just mocked nowadays. This theory states that in the early anime, when Pikachu uses a massive thunderbolt to knock out the Spearow, it also put Ash in a coma, after which the rest of the series is just a dream he has in the coma. This is why he seemingly doesn't age even over the course of 20 years, or however many years pass in the anime. There's some other evidence for this theory, but I'm not going to even bother with explaining it because this theory just straight up isn't true. Like, technically you can believe that this is true and that there's no evidence to contradict this, but it's just a lazy headcanon. Almost every series has some theory that the events of a story are just some dream or other delusion, and it's always seen as lazy. So let's move on. Kogita, Volo, Cynthia Going back to Volo, it's clear that he, Kogita, and Cynthia are blood-related, but what is the nature of their relationship? It's clear that Cynthia is the descendant of one or both of them. I mean, just look at them. But how are Volo and Kogita related? There are similar looks and connection to the Celestica people, so just a blood relation, but Kogita and Volo seemingly only are acquaintances at best. If we take into account the time-traveling Volo theory, maybe Volo is the distant ancestor of Kogita, who in turn is a more recent ancestor of Cynthia. However, if Volo is not a time traveler, I would say that he's a direct ancestor of Cynthia, while Kogita is just another branch of the family. Kogita is an older woman, and she doesn't mention having any children or relatives, meaning that she may not have any direct descendants. On the other hand, Volo is a young man, meaning that even after he disappeared, he definitely could have had children. Also, characters in Legends Arceus tend to parallel their descendants pretty heavily, and Volo is way more similar to Cynthia than Kogita is to Cynthia. Both Volo and Cynthia are extremely strong trainers with almost the same exact team that spend their time traveling Sinnoh researching its myths and legends. Second Mewtwo Origin in the Pokemon anime, evidence suggests that there are two Mewtwo's. Of course, the first one is iconic from the film Pokemon Mewtwo Strikes Back. In this movie, Mewtwo face kills its creators, after which it faces off against Ash. However, we see another Mewtwo in the film Genesect and The Legend Awakened. However, this Mewtwo does not recognize Ash. Additionally, the film has a prequel episode called Prologue to Awakening, which shows the backstory of this Mewtwo that differs from the original Mewtwo. The likely answer here is that another group of scientists cloned a Mew again, using the information gathered by the first, now dead, team of researchers. 
Because learning from the past is a dead concept, these scientists are lucky that the mutant they created wasn't as murderous as the first one. Inside a Pokeball What is inside a Pokeball? This question has plagued fans since the beginning of the series. Some people believe that the Pokeball is just electronics that convert Pokemon into data or energy. Others believe that the Pokemon just shrink and are just kind of trapped inside this cramped ball. However, the closest thing we get to a canonical answer comes from Junichi Masuda, who said that the inside of a Pokeball is very comfortable, similar to a high-end hotel suite. That's a vague answer, but an answer regardless, so don't feel bad about trapping your Pokemon in there. Legendaries aren't unique. This theory states that legendaries aren't one of a kind, but rather a species of super powerful Pokemon. Now, this makes sense, as multiple of the same legendary Pokemon can exist in one game, and legendaries like Mewtwo and the birds clearly can have more than one unique instance of them flying around. However, the bigger question lies with whether or not more than one major legendary who is lore important exists. For example, when it comes to Raikou, only one should exist, as it's a unique Pokemon that was resurrected by Ho-Oh. However, assuming the player caught one, people like Annabelle also own one, meaning that there are multiple. Now I'm conflicted on whether to call battle facility teams lore accurate, as the primary function of these facilities is to provide competitive challenges, they probably don't actually matter in lore. But there are story events that do allow you to catch other legendaries. With all this in mind, it's likely that some legendaries are just ones from other universes brought here, as seeing the Hoopa and Ultra Wormhole methods of catching them. But in the end, what's important here is the in-game function of being able to capture legendaries. Even if there's only one of the legendary canonically, it would suck if you could only get one copy of a legendary in its game of origin. Red Can't Talk As the protagonist of the Generation 1 games, Red is one of the most iconic characters in the series. A popular headcanon that the community has is that he is mute. This comes from the battle against him in the Generation 2 games, where before and after he fights you, he says nothing, the only text being ellipses. While this headcanon is so widespread that it's basically become accepted, it is false. Red not speaking to the player is just something that all Pokemon games do, and it's not that they literally don't speak, it's just that the speaking is implied but not explicitly shown. Also, in the Gen 1 games, there's a character called the Copycat who repeats what the player says, and here we see that Red does explicitly speak words. Also, the strange dialogue in the Gen 2 games can be one of two things. One, he just silently accepts your battle because he's a strong silent type, or we're supposed to insert whatever dialogue we think he says. Also, in continuities like Pokemon Origins, Red is shown to speak, so Red can talk, but how much he talks is up, up for speculation. Necrozma created Z-Crystals. Necrozma is the third legendary of Generation 7, being the Prism Pokemon. Prisms are typically made of fluorites, a gem culturally known for its spiritual and mental healing capabilities, thus Necrozma's psychic type. Some people also believe that fluorite has the ability to enhance mental power. If we consider that Pokemon moves are a result of their mental energy, we can say that Z-Crystals are a special stone that enhances his mental power to create a much more powerful attack. This spiritual incarnation of fluorides also states that it enhances harmony and flow of energy. And how do Z-Crystals work? The trainer does a dance to create the energy, which then flows into the Pokemon as both of them are in harmony. So if Necrozma and Z-Crystals are both made out of some fictional equivalent to fluorides, the two must be related somehow. This theory states that Z-Crystals are actually a part of Necrozma's body that shattered when Necrozma was permanently weakened hundreds of years ago. The psychic energy held within these shattered fragments of Necrozma's body became Z-Crystals, used to power up the moves of a Pokemon by utilizing the psychic link between it and its trainer. And how does Necrozma begin its original form, even if temporarily? By healing it using a special Z-Crystal. Starting in Gen 6, the legendaries of the region, specifically the third legendary, often was a direct cause of the gimmick of the region, so even if this wasn't explicitly stated, I would say that this theory is true. Zygarde in Alola why is Zygarde in Alola? For a Gen 6 Legendary, it plays a pretty big part in the Gen 7 games. Well, first of all, the answer here is that they needed to put Zygarde's extra content somewhere, considering that Gen 6 didn't get any expansion, so they just probably put it in the next game. But what is the in-game lore reason for Zygarde being in Alola? Well, Zygarde is known for being a Legendary that monitors the ecosystem and making sure the environment is in equilibrium and no threats to this balance occur. Of course, in its home region, it does this by making sure that Xerneas and Yoveltal, the incarnations of life and death, stay in balance. If life and death aren't balanced, that means the world is balanced, and that there aren't too many Pokemon alive or too many dying. When we look to Alola, we see another threat to the balance of the ecosystem, Ultra Beasts. During the lead-up to and during the story of the Generation 7 games, Ultra Wormholes are opened around Alola and bringing Ultra Beasts from other dimensions. 
You guys are literally the definition of an invasive species, and even if unintentional, they pose a huge danger to the ecosystem of Alola. So since he was needed, Zygarde himself went to Alola to deal with the issue and bring back balance to the region. Some other people that think that Zygarde cells just exist across the world, since the ecosystem is worldwide, and whenever a threat arises, the cores and cells form a more powerful incarnation of Zygarde to deal with the issue. Regardless of the reason, it's still really cool to see legendaries show up in the story of other games. It actually makes them feel like proper gods of the world, rather than a MacGuffin for one story that's just given to you in later games. Cubone Theories This entry regards the various theories surrounding Cubone. Cubone has a lot of discussion surrounding it, having particularly dark context as well as a spotlight in the Generation 1 games. Of course, most of this comes from the fact that Cubone supposedly wears the skull of its dead mother, according to Pokedex entries. Now, this has raised some questions. For example, regarding breeding, how is Cubone born with the skull of its dead mother, especially considering that its mother has the possibility of being a completely different species? If we take into consideration the previous theory that most Pokedex entries are just urban legends or written by children, we can assume that Cubone doesn't actually wear a skull but rather has some protrusion on its head that looks like a skull. Of course, people made up stories about how it's wearing a skull, and that and maybe Red, when writing the Dex entries, was influenced by these stories, as well as his own experiences with the ghost of Marowak. However, we can also assume that the Pokemon breeding is more of a meta mechanic for gameplay, and not actually how Pokemon reproduce canonically. After all, it doesn't make sense that, some po that all the Pokemon lay eggs, and there are a bunch of Pokemon that are born holding things, which shouldn't make sense. So let's entertain the notion that Cubone actually does wear the skull of its mother. Who is this mother? Of course, we would first assume that it would be Marowak, but that's boring. One theory states that Cubone's mother is actually Charizard. So typically Charmander are fire types, and maybe the attributes of this fire typing, like the fire on its tail, is nurtured by its mother. But if its mother dies early, then Charmander's fire attributes never manifest. These Charmander, now surviving on it their own, use the skull of their mother as a den, eventually growing into it and wearing it as a helmet. The skull Cubone wear looks similar to the head shape of Charizard, with those true protrusions at the back. This is why Cubone became ground type, as bones are usually associated with the ground. Eventually, the skull fuses with the head of Cubone, evolving it into Marowak. Another theory which actually is supported by the official series is that Kangaskhan is Cubone's mother. Kangaskhan is a Pokemon associated with motherhood, as its defining feature is that it holds a baby in its pouch. As such, it's not a stretch to believe that it has a connection to the Cubone line, another line with motherhood as a theme. Additionally, the baby in Kangaskhan's pouch does look similar to a Cubone without its skull. Also, even though Kangaskhan is a normal type, Giovanni, a ground type specialist, does use one on his team. All of this combined can lead to the theory that maybe Kangaskhan was originally a part of the Cubone line, as maybe the third stage or even a split evolution. And in Generation 7, we get more evidence for this theory. Gen 7 introduced a mechanic called SOS Battles. Basically, a wild Pokemon has a chance to call for help, bringing another wild Pokemon to the battle. In the vast majority of cases, these SOS calls usually bring in a Pokemon of the same species, or a Pokemon that has an established connection. And when Cubone calls for help, there is a small chance for none other than Kangaskhan to show up. However, I should mention the evidence against the theory and my thoughts on it. 1. People say that the baby is in Kangaskhan's pouch is a completely different color scheme than Cubone. While this is true, Cubone's color scheme is similar to the mother Kangaskhan. Kangaskhan clearly start out blue as infants and become brown as adults, so Cubone's color scheme still makes sense. Other people say that the skull on Cubone doesn't match the head shape of Kangaskhan. While this is true, bones often don't match the shape of an animal completely, as stuff like fat covers them, so this bit of contradiction is also invalid. Finally, the SOS call just means that there's a connection between the two species, not that they're actually related. It's possible that the orphaned Cubone, when crying for help, is like a baby crying for its mother, and the Kangaskhan, with its motherly instincts, shows up to help even if the baby isn't hers. A valid point. I do think that even if these two Pokemon aren't meant to be part of the same species, they definitely have a connection. Power of Alola. This is an anime theory, so I don't have the full context to this. But it seems that the power of Alola is something that Ash says gives him the power to fight harder and win. Now, there's some discussion about the specifics of this, especially in regards to Z-moves, but consensus seems to be that this is just a typical anime power of friendship mumbo-jumbo. I don't think we need to look too deeply into it. Lyco is in a coma. 
This is a joke entry parodying the Ash coma theory. The idea is that Lyco injured herself and fell into a coma in the first episode of her show, and that the rest of the show is just in her dreams. It's pretty funny considering how popular the Ashes in a coma theory was like 10 years ago. Nimona stalks the player. To end the first layer, we have Nimona stalks the player. Huh, weird rhyme. But yeah, Nimona is the rival character of the Generation 9 games, and has gained a bit of a reputation for being a weirdo obsessed with the protagonist. We know that she's already a champion, but despite that, she takes an interest in you specifically and decides to basically redo the entire league a whole another time, just to do it with you. She follows you around and constantly challenges you to battle, to the point where other characters will have to tell her to leave you alone. This behavior has led to many comparisons with the typical anime trope in the Yandere, the girl who is completely obsessed with the male character, to the point of resorting to stalking and violence. However, she doesn't do this for romantic reasons, but rather for battling reasons. It's implied that Nimona is so strong she just stomps everybody else in battle. So she learns about her new neighbor that's moving in, and decides to basically restart her journey to challenge the league alongside you. And then as she battles you, she realizes that you're a prodigy like her, and becomes more obsessed with battling you, knowing that once you earn the champion rank, she'd finally have someone to battle with on her own level. So yeah, she's kind of a mixture between the aforementioned Yandere trope and someone like Goku, who just genuinely loves training and battling, and seeks out strong people to fight. So with that, Layer 1 of the Pokemon Conspiracy Iceberg is over. I had a lot of fun making this, and I hope you guys had fun watching. But this is literally like one tenth of the full iceberg. Do you guys want to see me cover the rest of the layers in the iceberg? Let me know down in the comments. I probably will cover the rest, but depending on the reception and comments, I'll decide whether to prioritize this series over other videos. So make sure to let me know if you want to see more parts. Additionally, liking and subscribing will also let me know that you enjoyed the video. I hope you all have a great day, and I'll see you guys next time.